We have an excellent lineup for you today, and we will be offering one hour of CPE. Looks like our audience is continuing to grow, so we have an impressive group of people joining our session today as well. Let's go ahead and cover some of the CPE items before we get going. Uh, to receive CPE credit, you must answer at least three of the four polling questions and attend for the full 50 minutes. Now, those CPE certificates will be issued via email within 10 days. If after 10 days you haven't received one, you can email cbhlearning at cbh.com. A recorded version of the webinar will also be available in about a week. It'll be posted to our website and sent out via email. Now, if you have any questions during the webinar, go ahead and type those into the Q&A window that is located down at the bottom of your control panel. And one last thing, uh, a short survey is also going to be posted at the conclusion of the session. We value your feedback and just ask that you take part. Okay, Sarah, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Maddie. And Maddie will be here to handle all your uh, technical Q&A and issues. And I'll be here to watch the chat pod and the questions pod to field your questions to our presenters. Today, I'm delighted that Marty Karaman is joining us. He is a partner in our tax credits and uh, incentives advisory practice. He's the leader for our for that group. Uh, Vivian Coors and Corning Pearson are both directors in our credits and incentives group, and they bring a lot of experience to the table. We've been having conversations about Section 174 and its impact for quite some months and uh, and also dealing with it directly with clients. So they bring a great level of experience here to this conversation. Uh, I'm Sarah McGregor. I'm a director in our tax uh, practice and uh, have been thinking about this and the impact to uh, taxpayers and how it works for them. So this is going to be a great program. I think that is enough from my side. So Marty, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, oh, sorry, I think we have our first polling question. Uh, that's up first. So uh, Maddie, if you'll go ahead and bring up that polling question. So just a real quick, get you used to answering the poll question, see what they look like coming. Let us know how uh, you were heard about this webinar. That would help us to know uh, what you're hearing. Great. And we'll give you just a minute there. I think today's program is, you know, when there's not a lot of IRS guidance, out there, the people, taxpayers either flourish or uh, flounder. And we hope that by the end of today, you'll be able to flourish a little bit, even in this uh, period of uncertainty about how all this Section 174 works. Okay, Manny, are we in a good place to, to move forward? I'm going to keep it open for about five more seconds for those who are just joining us. So if you see a poll, go ahead and answer it. We're going to shut it down here in a couple seconds. Okay, votes are in. All right, Marty, I think you're up to, to give us a, a where we're going today. Yeah, I'll set the table, as they say. Thank you, Sarah. So for anybody who's on this, um, as you're probably aware, uh, as part of the tax law changes enacted in 2017 under the, what was known as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, basically tax reform that took place back in 2017 that kicked in in 2018, uh, beginning in 22, specifically for tax years ending after 131 2021, Congress now requires taxpayers to capitalize research and experimentation expenditures, uh, and they define them as 174 costs, and you have to capitalize them and now amortize them either over a five-year period with the mid-year convention or a 15-year period with the mid-year convention, depending on whether it is a domestic expense or a foreign expense respectively. This varies differently and radically from the old law, um, where prior to 22, uh, these uh, types of what we'll call 174 expenses, expenses in the research and experimental uh, variety, um, you could expense them. Uh, you actually have flexibility. You could, you could expense them immediately, or you could choose to either amortize them over five or 10 years, depending on uh, the utilization of some other, um, some other tax code. Uh, additionally, uh, in 2022, um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act also specifically added software development uh, to the definition of R&E um, expenditures under Section 174. So as a result, 
um, all software development costs must now be capitalized as well as uh, amortized. Um, and that's whether or not the software is intended for internal or, um, or external use. <clears throat> Corning is going to cover this a little bit, but the IRS did get out some guidance on this specific to uh, changing your accounting method. This is obviously important because your accounting method change requires permission um, from expensing to capitalizing and amortizing. It was made clear um, that if you do this in the first year that it, you're required to, 2022, um, you get auto protection for the prior years and you don't have to file a 3115. So Corning will get into some of that later. Um, in terms of additional guidance right now, the IRS is working on procedural guidance, but it's not doing it particularly quickly. Um, you know, the, the, some, the basic questions of what does capitalization mean, um, you know, which expenses qualify? Is there a de minimis mis exception? How does it differ from the research credit? These are the questions everybody's asking, and it's kind of some of the stuff we're going to address today. Um, but it's not a real high priority for them right now. Uh, and so I don't expect anything to come out before people have to make estimated payments or potentially um, file. Um, there's not a lot of case law in this matter, in this area as well, because it really didn't matter that much because it wasn't too different from a 162 expense. People could automatically uh, deduct it. So the guidance is spare, um, but we have some rules of the road that we're going to share with you today. Um, and, you know, everybody's hoping that Congress gets their act together a little bit and potentially addresses this by um, putting it back to the way it used to be. Um, and there, there is hope and there is both bipartisan there is bipartisan support for that. Having a vehicle to attach that to and having Congress actually get together and vote on something in a collaborative way, I think we won't hold our breath immediately right now, but, um, but that's where we are. And I just wanna thank everybody for joining today. And we're gonna talk about the legal framework in all these, all these areas right here. Uh, and very also just wanna say, I'm very um, impressed with my directors for pulling this together, Vivian and Corning, and also with the support of my partners, Ron Wainwright and Dan Menel as well. Um, We've been talking about this every day, uh, internally in our little working groups and also with clients um, and also to some other firms as well, just to see what, what's going on. So we're well informed and we thank you for joining. <laughs> All right, so we'll talk about the legal framework a bit and, and then I'll hand it off to Corning in a, in a moment. But um, as you can see, what, what's on this slide isn't much more than there is actually in the statute for 174. 174A talks about you know, your requirement to capitalize and amortize specific r &E expenses charge them to a capital account. And again, that rule about domestic expenses are amortized over five years using a mid-year convention, foreign 15 years using a mid-year convention. Sections 174 B and C just talk a bit and, and define specified uh, R&E expenditures, which is a little bit um, further uh, illuminated in the regulations, but research experimentation expenditures are those which are paid or incurred by the taxpayer during the year in its trade or business. Software is by definition a 174 expense, software development. Um, we've been doing some analysis as, as for companies that work in software, is it true development they're doing or is it something else? That's something we can talk about a bit as well. 174C just has some very special rules um, about some areas that aren't maybe 174 as well. Land buildings and equipment and tangible assets are not research and experimentation. Depreciation or amortization may be and may be charged to a capital account. Um, and exploration expenses are accepted from the definition. So they would not be included as a 174 expense. In the regs, it talks a bit about like the definition of, of research and experiment, ugh, research and experimentation expenditures. Um, and again, those are those expenses incurred in connection with the taxpayer's trade or business, which represent RD in the laboratory sense. Generally speaking, it's those activities that are intended to eliminate some uncertainty, either with respect to the capability of getting something done or the method by which uh, that gets done. It includes, and this is this is why it's so broad, all costs incident to the development um, of the improvement of a product. Um, it's an activity-based test, so we look for what the company or the taxpayer is doing, not the nature of the product, not the level of technical advancement, but really whether they're addressing uncertainty and those, then those expenses associated that would be um, research and experimentation, 174 expenses. Success, failure, sale or use of the product process is not, is not relevant um, and can be post-production if there's uncertainty as well. You probably are familiar with some of these concepts if you're claiming a research credit. Um, 
It's an interesting allegory. It's close, but these are a larger group of costs that would go into uh, into the analysis. Why don't we move on? Okay, and just within the regs, there's uh, some examples. Basically, obtaining obtaining a patent. You know, attorney fees uh, with respect to making and perfecting a patent application would be included. It does not include fees for defending existing patents. Products can include, include pilot models, processes, formulas, inventions, technique, patent, or similar property. Um, and again, exclusions. We're always thinking about what's in as the uncertain type of activities. What's out, the exclusions are ordinary quality control testing, efficiency surveys, management studies, advertising promotion, and again, acquisition of existing patents, models, production methods, and processes. So hopefully that sets the tone a little bit. We're always focused on those activities that are specifically intended to eliminate uncertainty, um, but it can be a broad number of expenses. All right, Corning, why don't you take it away and talk a bit about some of the administrative guidance? Great, thanks, Marty. Um, if there is an underlying theme here, it is sort of a lack of guidance. What Marty just went over really is the qualitative guidance that's come out, um, whether it's the new statute, there are some coordinating uh, elements that have been changed to 41 and 280C as well um, that were just required in order to do this. But if we need to look beyond that, we're looking towards um, administrative guidance that already is in existence, case law that was covered under 174 previously. So you kind of enter into a almost a bizarro world where the taxpayer positive guidance where they were seeking to get things categorized as 174 uh, in order to deduct them now gets treated as 174 that's required to be allocated. So that's one thing to be careful as you're looking towards guidance outside of the statute, outside of the pertinent direct regs that pertain to this. Um, the IRS in late last year put out the uh, Rev Proc. It's an administrative guidance towards um, towards filing your tax return, uh, amended it in the middle of January with RevPoc 2023-11, which is the latest guidance that we have on that. Um, this is sort of a teaser for a little bit more granular detail later, but just know that this is an accounting method change. You are not required to file a 3115 if you're filing timely on a timely or extended return for the first year uh, that you have pertinent expenses after December 31st, 2021. Uh, it is a cutoff method if you're filing on time in the first year. Um, no 481A adjustment is required. If you are filing late, um, if it is the second tax year in which you have expenses after 1231, 2021, uh, you are required to file a 3115 and there will be a catch up 481A. We'll go over a little bit where some of those cases might occur in the instant time for short tax years early in 22. So basically that's the only guidance the IRS has put out. As Marty said, we're promised more later, but as we go on, we're, we do have experience in this area. We, we as taxpayers and taxpayer advocates, so we can rely on some of the guidance in other areas that are similar to this. I'll All right. Yeah, we're up to our second polling question. So did your company incur Section 174 research and experimentation expenditures in 2022? Uh, give us your thoughts on that. Tell us what you think uh, right now that um, if you have those uh, or if you are did not or are not sure. So we'd appreciate that. And uh, Marty, already a couple of uh, questions have come in. If I can uh, uh, give throw one to you. So you mentioned software. Uh, software development, uh, is, is that just for internally used, intended use software or for external use uh, and licensing outside of the entity as well? you'll find that my answer is always going to be as expansive as possible to any of these questions. So it's, it's both. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's, it's a broadly defined software development expense. There are some other rules out there in a thing called RevProc 2050 that differentiates between software development, 
from software configuration, from maintenance and support. So when we're thinking about software development, we're not necessarily concerned with whether it's for internal or external use. We're more concerned with what are they actually doing from a software development perspective? And is it true development? And can it maybe be carved away into a different category of activity? Great. All right. And one more. Uh, you guys have had great success in helping, uh, say, uh, a &E firms, architecture and engineering firms find research uh, tax credits that yeah. could benefit those organizations. So it would also uh, seem likely that these organizations, even though they're personal service, they would also uh, potentially have Section 174 research and experimentation costs as well. Expansive answer again, and, and absolutely so. And, and I think you bring up a good point here. It's that this is not related to the research credit in the sense that if you don't claim a research credit, you still have to go through the uh, identification of whether or not you do or do not have any Section 174 um, expenses. And, you know, we've had some early conversations with taxpayers where they've indicated, OK, well, maybe I won't claim a research credit this year, so I don't have to do this. It doesn't work, unfortunately. So um, we will always look to the nature of the activity. And so, yes, Sarah, you're correct. All right. Maddie, are we uh, pretty good on the question? Can we go forward now? We are. I'm going to go ahead and share those results right now. Excellently. So it looks like uh, people are all, all across the board there for in thinking about uh, where they are with, with Section 174 costs. Uh, Vivian, I think you're next to, to talk to us about some of the practical approaches and ways of thinking about how we find these costs. I know. So we talked about this before. This this is a broad kind of research and experimentation catch-all bucket of costs, right? So how can we provide some guidance to for taxpayers to look at their books, to look at their costs and try to capture those costs, at least to figure out what the potential impact is to their taxable income? So suggesting just suggested approaches are kind of listed here, but I would just kind of broadly say, hey, put on your 174 hat and kind of think about what costs are incidental to my development? Would it be the CFO's time? Because in, in theory, they're running the entire company and a portion of that company is doing R&D. So the CFO's costs are in support of development and incidental to development. So just kind of think about things. They are broad. They are meant to be broad. Um, so to the extent that your company has previously claimed an R&D tax credit and are claiming an R&D tax credit for 2022, I would suggest that that would be a good starting point for you to start identifying your Section 174 expenses because 41 expenses are, are kind of like your core 174 costs. Also, it's important to kind of review your actual activities. The Section 174 is an activities-based analysis. So look through your contracts, kind of understand what are you providing if you are a professional service provider to your customers, or if you have developed your own software, your own product, your own processes, just understanding those activities and where those costs are located. Um, look at your internal budgeting. If you follow ASC 730, those would also be great points to start. And to the extent that you have already capitalized costs for book accounting, when you're looking at your GL accounts to find research and experimentation expenses, don't forget the cost that you already capitalized, <laughs> just in case um, those would be generally 174. But I would say 174 is much broader than ASC 730 and definitely broader than just Section 41 R&D tax credit costs. Um, so general approach would be start with your GL expenses to so make sure you're not missing any of those costs and go through account by account to kind of identify, okay, yes, this uh, the salary amount for engineers are definitely related to R&D. But I would suggest you take a step further, right? Because are truly all of those engineers spending 100% of their time addressing technically challenging processes or product to design questions? Probably not. So that would give you a segue to carve out the costs that are not necessarily research and experimentation in nature. Um, also, there are definite, definite, definitely general and administrative type costs and departments where it would be important to figure out what is a reasonable way to allocate those costs to research and experimentation activities. 
um, understanding that, hey, there is no technical guidance around this as of right now. But as long as it's reasonable, as long as it kind of matches your facts and circumstances, I would say that that would be a good approach to start with. And it's important to clearly document your methodology um, so that you can create a repeatable and defendable process in the event of an audit. So maybe it is by that GL account approach. You look at certain accounts, you establish, hey, year over year, this is pretty similar, that this is always going to be um, travel entertainment for marketing department. That would probably not be R&D, so nothing that you need to. Just making sure that you document that would be an important start. Um, and then make sure that you're separating out your onshore and offshore costs um, to the extent that your general ledger accounts aren't set up to capture that. Make sure you're digging through the detail by vendor or if certain vendors have half of their resources onshore, half of their resources on offshore, make sure that you're documenting that and capturing just the appropriate amounts so that you can capitalize and amortize according to whether it's an onshore activity or an offshore activity. Um, and again, making sure that you're not missing anything or um, applying too broad stroke of an approach that would either overstate or understate your Section 174 costs. Um, lastly, you would have to summarize your Section 174 costs in the um, in your disclosure statement for your 2022 tax year um, or the first tax year after December 31st, 2021. Um, so just make sure that you're cap capturing those costs appropriately. And so, Vivian, this sounds a lot like a, a Section 263A kind of analysis. I mean, that's yeah, absolutely even, without further guidance. It seems like the kind of approach you'd want to take. Uh, but maybe not being so uh, so well defined. Absolutely. So when you kind of think about Unicap and your square footage approach, maybe that would be a great starting point for some of the rent and utilities that you are trying to allocate to your research and experimentation activities. So thank you, Sarah, for bringing that up. Now on Section 174 costs, where you are trying to calculate that with Section 41 R and D tax credit as your starting point. Um, just remember that Section 41 expenses are very specific amounts that are that are going to be part of your 174, but not all of your 174. One of those areas would be wage QREs. So when you kind of think about your wage QREs for your R&D credit, remember it's box one only, but in the Section 174 sense, it's really the loaded employee costs. So that would include gross wages, their health insurance, payroll taxes. Um, basically, how much does that employee cost to you that because their employees and the activities associated with that employee and such associated costs would be 174 incidental. Um, it would also include any foreign wages or foreign third party contractors to the extent that they are doing the work. And again, just a reminder, foreign activities are not eligible for the R&D tax credit, but you would still have to capitalize and amortize that for Section 174 purposes over 15 years with a mid-year convention. Um, lease of computers, this is probably an area where I would expect the Section 41 costs and the Section 174 costs to be similar. Um, just make sure that you're carving out production costs associated with your cloud hosting spend. Um, or if this, this is truly a lease of computers, like you are renting laptops from Dell to perform your research and development, carve out the portion of estimated time that the individual spends on the laptop for production work. Um, again, that would likely follow the employee's qualifying percentages for the R&D tax credit. Um, third party contractors. So we kind of talked about this instead of the 25 or 35 percent haircut that you would have to take for the R&D tax credit, the Section 174 costs would require you to capture that at 100%. Um, a lot of people maybe sometimes forget to add those back. So just make sure that you remember to do that. Um, supplies, I would expect that area to be somewhat similar as well, uh, just to the extent that it meets technical uncertainty. You are trying to address some of the challenges that you are seeing in your development process and you are consuming those supplies as part of that. That would be Section 174 and Section 41 costs. And Courtney, did you want to cover the foreign activities? Unmute. Um, thanks. I did want to go back and think about uh, how we developed our methodology and looking at our clients. Um, it is important to, without the guidance that a 263 cap A affords or a D-pad type of a holistic approach, um, I think it is important to understand 
what the IRS may be looking for or may issue as guidance going forward. And we do have those two areas and other areas where you're allocating costs um, and, you know, not necessarily directly, but in times, certain times indirectly for GNA accounts um, to see what the IRS has done in the past. It gives you an idea of what they may do in the future. Um, so if you have experience working in them or if you're, you know, in uh, an industry, knowing your facts and circumstances with respect to the 263 cap eight D pad, there will be likely a similar analysis to be done here. Um, but again, I saw a question earlier about foreign activity come through the um, through the chat. For an this is an activity based analysis, so it's where the activity is conducted. So when you're looking at vendors, it will be where their employees are conducting the activity. It's not necessarily the domicile of the entity that's doing the activity. So if it's done in the U.S. or U.S. territories, it's domestic. Offshore is offshore. Um, for foreign activity, we look to mainly three areas or three categories of expenses. It would be for employees that you might may be having offshore, and this would include CFCs. So if you have a CFC, as you know, you analyze the expenses as if they were a U.S. taxpayer. So this analysis would be done, needed to be done if you have a CFC. Um, so employees that are doing work that qualifies as 174 would need to be capitalized as well as any contractors that you're utilizing offshore, doing their activities offshore, um, would need to be capitalized as well. As I think about this, if you have people traveling that are US-based, but traveling off overseas to do R&D activity, you would need to do an analysis to see what time they're spending off doing that activity offshore versus what they're doing here domestically, include those together. Um, and then the third category would be any foreign supplies or any supplies that are being used in that foreign activity. So that might be if you're developing a new manufacturing process, say in China, if you're running through raw materials in order to test that, those types of supplies would be included as well. So depreciation and amortization, that's different from the amortization that you're getting after you capitalize these expenses. These will be depreciation and amortization expenses for assets that are being used in R&D. So let's say you have developed a piece of equipment that you're utilizing for testing. It's capitalized. You're utilizing it over several years to test your products. The depreciation for that asset would go into the 174 analysis. Software would be included if you're doing software development. Um, you've got some developed software or some purchased software that you're amortizing. Those costs would need to be included in the amortization or in the capitalization as well. Um, included in this is also an allocation of depreciation and amortization for assets that are utilized in the business overall. These could be buildings. It could be generally anything that's, that applies to the entire organization that are incident to the R&D and required. So to the extent that you have a building, you've got people working in the building, they're doing the R&D, you would include that. But there is an opportunity to exclude it if you have, say, a software development company that uh, all of the people are working remotely. You would not need to do if all the activity was done outside of the building, the rent was specifically for administrative functions that don't necessarily touch the R&D. In this case, you wouldn't need to include that. There may be expenses uh, that the company is incurring to have those people work remotely, but that's another consideration. Other incidental costs that you might want to include that we don't necessarily include in, say, an R&D credit, but that you need to look through your general ledger uh, as you're doing this analysis might be for equipment rental that obviously is not uh, being capitalized, some shipping costs if you've got, say, a drug company that has, you know, they're doing testing on new drugs, but they have to ship them out to the various clinical locations, et cetera, that could be included as well, um, as well as any maintenance, calibration, et cetera, if you're developing a new product, you need to test it, a new manufacturing process, you need to test that. Those costs need to be pulled in as well. And again, as, as 
Vivian alluded to, a reasonable allocation methodology as long as it, again, is, re is reasonable, as long as you're documenting it and it's traceable, um, will likely pass muster with the IRS. But again, it, just like everything else having to do with R&D, your substantiation, your documentation, et cetera, is key here. So again, it, it's not necessarily just your direct costs that are required to be um, required to be capitalized. Again, this gets back to the the to quote Marty the any cost that's incident to the R and D or connected with the R and D needs to be included. So there are costs, overhead costs that need to be included in the allocation as well. So general administrative costs, things like rent, things like office supplies, technology, communication, keeping the internet running, um, any licensing and permits that are required for, to keep the company running, those need to be allocated. Um, there are numerous ways you can do it. Again, reasonable, traceable, documented, et cetera. Um, you, know, you can do it based on, again, going back to that activity-based, basis of the analysis, if you can include the amount of costs for um, the wages of the people that are employed for overall, over the, um, the amount of overall wages, these are salaries, um, you can allocate it that way if that makes sense, if it's more of a square footage consideration, if that makes more sense for rent and you know what those costs, those numbers are, you can utilize that methodology. But again, it goes back to what information you have what makes the most sense, what's reasonable, what can be documented. Things that can be included. And again, this is these are things that you'll wanna look at. This is an expansive thing as Marty said, uh, but again, we do wanna look at the expenses that can be excluded. Things like sales, marketing, production related costs. So you'll wanna look at cost of goods sold. You'll wanna look at your sales force, et cetera. If they're not involved in the R&D activities, those costs don't need to be uh, included. And to the extent that you have uh, cost-based accounting, that makes that helpful. Again, we are utilizing, for the most part, a general ledger approach so that we can identify things within trial balance accounts to identify, advocate for our clients by pulling out some of these costs that might not be in a cost-related uh, trial balance account. Uh, again, really the key here is to be reasonable, make sure that, uh, make sure that you can explain what you're doing and that it's traceable back to the trial balance. And I think so, we have another poll. Yeah, so we're at our next poll. And uh, Matt, as you're bringing that up, Vivian, I did want to ask you um, in talking about allocation, you've actually worked worked through a couple of client situations recently on allocating expenses and working with them. Can you share a little bit about some of that experience helping? Yeah, them with absolutely. A good approach. What? It's always important to think about the facts and circumstances specific to the company, because it's going to be different for everybody. In one company, it might make sense to not allocate any rent because none of their developers come into the office. Um, other companies might make more sense to allocate by headcount. Um, or if you have a big manufacturing company that has its R&D space um, in the same area as a huge warehouse space, um, it would be important to maybe take a square footage approach as opposed to headcount approach, just because warehouses generally take up a huge chunk of the actual rent and utilities. So again, it all really depends on what makes sense for your specific facts and circumstances. Um, headcount approach is generally recommended because it is easier to figure out um, for some of the GNA type support. So if you're thinking about, hey, my CFO is supporting the entire company, going back to that example that I was talking about, maybe a FTE, number of FTEs directly involved in R&D would be a better approach because in... <laughs> In this example, the CFO is supporting everybody equally versus if you wanted to allocate a fringe account, maybe it makes more sense by allocating the 174 wages over total wages as opposed to headcount because presumably people are paid differently and your fringe is based on your base pay. So those are just kind of different areas and kind of different thinking and methodologies that you can kind of approach things based on your facts and circumstances. Right, and so we had a question about using the, uh, Section 40, 41 credit, 
as a as a as an approximate or a way to uh, uh, use that in lieu of Section 174. And I think, as you guys have said, um, Section 174 is really broader. So uh, and Section 41 actually excludes costs like no foreign activities and uh, only 65 percent of contract costs and things and and the kind of wage cost is limited that's included so you really need to to look further uh there was another comment about um hey if, if you're taking depreciation uh aren't we really just moving depreciation over somewhere else and recapitalizing it and amortizing it again um yes unfortunately that is what's being asked here for uh for for these purposes <clears throat> in section 174. Uh, there was one more question I wanted to address here. Um, and Marty, I think you're up next. So you might want to uh, talk about this before you talk software. And that is, um, you know, can you have, is one cost, can one cost be a 162 ordinary necessary business expense in a section 174 um, uh, a cost for research and experimentation expenditure at the same time? Not anymore. Uh, <laughs> back in the day, yes, you could. You, you really didn't matter. But it it it, it is it is a one seventy four expense only in this case. It's capitalizable and amortizable. And I know it's painful. And the more homework we do, we're finding more costs that have to be capitalized. We had seven hundred people that signed up for this. Obviously, we're not alone. Uh, everybody's going through this together, and uh, we're doing our best to help companies come up with a reasonable methodology. Um, based on the fact and circumstances in that year, right? Uh, it can change year to year depending on what the company is doing. I noticed somebody asked a question about whether or not COVID policies that were in effect that the company was adhering to uh, that maybe kept people out of the office, would that cause some amount of the allocation of the rent expense to go down? Possibly, yes. It really is based on what the facts and circumstances were in that year. In 23, if those, if more people are back in the office, then, then yeah, maybe, maybe you have a higher amount in 23. Great. Uh, Vivian, you want to move us forward to uh, to talk about software, which is a pretty messy area. It is definitely a messy area. So as Marty alluded to earlier, RevProc 2000-50 kind of gives you some guidance around what is software development. So Section 174 is very clear in stating, hey, software development is 174, just given the nature of what you do as a software developer. Um, but it's important, right? That's how, that's how your consultant, or that's how we can come and help you, is to figure out how best to carve out what is not software development. So a lot of times when we kind of think about the capturing the wages for folks who are doing software development, to the extent that they're doing any of the keep the lights on, what, we, like, what they call KTLO, um, help desk, tech support, um, a lot of the is going to be maintenance, repair, some minor enhancements, bug fixes that don't arise to the level of technical uncertainty, that would not be software development. Um, some of the big questions, and I know someone asked this earlier on kind of licensing um, and customizations of software. So I would say that the straightforward installation, implementation, configuration of software is not software development. However, the customization pieces where you are where you are writing custom code on top of the licensed software or off the shelf product costs or what they call it, um, then that portion could potentially be 174. So it's always important to kind of think about how how much of my software development activities really is custom coding, writing machine readable code that addresses technical that is technically uncertain versus straightforward implementation and installation. Uh, kind of similar to software, like on the same train of thought, to the extent that as part of your software development or as part of your research and development of your products that's non-software, to the extent that you guys are utilizing any of the software licenses or data subscription costs as part of your R&D, you would also have to include those costs as 174. Um, however, some of those other licenses, like for example, Zoom or Microsoft Office, so you can send out an email, is probably more of a GNA type cost across that's used across all of the company. So just remember, you can maybe allocate those at a lower rate. Um, other software development costs that someone uh, taxpayer should consider would be maybe potentially again. This all depends on your facts and circumstances of your company. So to the extent you're paying stipends for developers to work from home or maybe they have office meals, weekly meals. That's some of the fact patterns that we have seen as we discuss this more 
um, as we go through a GL approach is asking those questions like, hey, what are the costs associated with this GL account? I don't I don't quite understand it is finding out, oh, yeah, this is this is the weekly meal that's part of basically employee benefits. So as such, that's really um, that's really part incidental to development and you can allocate it based on FTE. Um, other types of software development costs would, would be to the extent you're using computer hardware um, that not necessarily software, but hardware used for testing that would also need to be capitalized for R&D 174 purposes. All right. Oh, yes, Vivian, thank you for assigning me the most controversial slide in the deck. So um, I appreciate it very much. And the reason this is, is because uh, there's a fundamental unfairness that is inherent in some of these rules right now. If we think about the research credit, you have the concept of R&D that is funded by an outside third party. And by virtue of that, the third party can claim a research credit for that and not the actual taxpayer who's doing the, we'll call it development, or potentially the software development in that case. There is no um, similar concept in the 174 rules, at least right now, when it comes to um, at least in the plain reading of the statute and the regulations. This is clearly the area where we are craving guidance from the IRS, because uh, when you have an, an activity that qualifies as research and experimentation, and it is funded by a third party, what happens in that case? Because from a research credit perspective, you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't be able to include it in your credit, but the concept of funding is nowhere in the 174 regulations. And so you end up with the possibility, of, we'll think about something like double capitalization, where the payor uh, is paying for research performed by you and you are performing research and there's no carve out for that right now. So what our, what our best method is, is to understand exactly what the nature of the activity is. Is there any amount, it wouldn't be in the research credit anyway, but is there any amount of the activity that can be reasonably uh, said to be not a research and a, an experimentation expense. But if it is, there's no specific rule that allows you to uh, not include it in your 174 cost just because it's funded by someone else right now. So clearly this is the area that's very gray. As it says here, no final guidance, facts and circumstances, look at your contracts, look at what you're doing. Um, and obviously consult with your tax advisor, hopefully us in that case, because uh, we have we have the benefit of seeing a multitude of um, different fact patterns uh, and just thinking about whether it's truly software development, whether it's maintenance, whether it's configuration, maybe it's something else other than true development in that case. Um, but clearly, this is the area where we're all hoping hoping for some taxpayer favorable guidance in the future. All right, um, just this is an easy slide to get through, but again, a little painful, right? From a domestic perspective, as we mentioned, there's a five-year, you capitalize and amortize over five years, but again, it's a mid-year convention, which means you only get 10% of the costs that are 174 that are currently deductible in the, uh, in the current year. This foreign cost, 15 years, I mean, you're really getting 1 30th, 1 30th of it in 2022. Uh, when you think about applying this mid-year convention. And this onerous rule here on disposition, um, you don't get to immediately deduct if you dispose, retire, or abandon the, the project um, during the amortization period. It continues dis despite it being abandoned. And so um, that's very clearly stated in the rules um, since this changed in 2022. So before we go into the next section, there was a question about um, uh, it, uh, some lease expense on data centers. And yeah, to the extent that those lease expense is for the portion of the data center that's used for software development or research and experimentation efforts. Yeah, that's the kind of cost that would be incidental to and associated with uh, or, or research and experimentation activities, and therefore is the kind of expense that is falls under Section 174 um, on, on there. Um, again, we had some questions about, you know, thinking about the funding research, just hiring an engineer to do some work. Uh, that work may not necessarily resolve uncertainty. We, we may know how to, to already do something or to, to design a website, 
And so therefore it might not qualify as uh, something that resolves uncertainty or qualifies as the software development. So again, uh, you know, looking at the kinds of activities that are going on uh, and the kinds of things that are asked for is uh, what's, what's really important in this process. Good. Uh, Manny, how are we doing on the polling question there? I just went ahead and ended that poll and the results are posted. So most of you said about 15 years. And that, Otherwise, we have we have a spread between five and 10 and a few said 39. Right. For new 2022 expenses under Section 174, it is going to be 15 years. Uh, if you were thinking about um, something from a prior year, you might have had that five or, or 10 year um, electable amortization in mind. All right. Uh, Cor uh, Corning, I think we're back to you on what goes into your 2022 tax return. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I've kept an eye on some of the questions. I think I can answer a number of them. If I could just take a second to um, emphasize something by repetition. Uh, 174 is a requirement for taking the R&D credit. So if you take that logic backwards, uh, anything that you're taking as an expense in your in your R and D credit, if you're taking if you're claiming an R and D credit, is required to be capitalized. So salaries, lease a computer, supplies, contract research, both in the U S. and offshore, but um, anything that's onshore, you're including in that uh, R and D calculation. All of those need to be capitalized. Just to take that a little step, uh, one step further, the salaries that you're taking for the credit are W two salaries. In this case, for 174, we're required to utilize gross wages, so it would include those pre-tax items, benefits as well. Um, and then for the contract research expenses, for the credit, we're including those at 65% for most vendors. We would need to gross that up to 100% for the capitalization. Um, so this is an extension of the uh, RevProc 2023-11 guidance. And essentially what they're saying is that this is a, a method change, but you're not required necessarily to file a 3115. It's a cutoff method, so it's all costs from the beginning of the tax year forward. So anything after December 31st, 2021, um, to the extent it's the first tax year, um, you are able to file a statement. And I'll go over what the requirements for that statement are in a second. Um, but you're able to file a statement in lieu of filing that 3115. So everybody knows 3115 is kind of a daunting form. Um, this just, what they've done is they've parsed out the relevant information that they would like to see without somebody that maybe doesn't have experience with 3115 having to go through that, find out what the information they would need to it include versus what they could exclude. One caveat is if it's a short, if it's a short tax year or the second year, I guess it's if it's any second tax year um, in which you are first making that election, you are required to file a 3115. That includes a 41A adjustment for the catch-up expenses you would be required to deduct, uh, to, I'm sorry, to capitalize. So one thing to be careful about would be in the case where you have a short tax year that perhaps hasn't been filed yet, that ended early in 22, or that's been extended, um, if you can file and it is extended, you can utilize for that short tax year, this statement in lieu. But if an extension wasn't filed, the tax return is late. That tax return would need to be filed as if 174 wasn't enacted because you can't elect on a, on a late tax return. And then the second tax year would be the second short year in which you would have to file a 3115. So that goes against this third bullet point because I'm either misunderstanding that or no. The the third bullet point just to, is if someone has already filed their 22 tax return, it was uh, say the short year was from January through uh, June 30, and they filed already by uh, say September 15 or October 15, um, then they can include this statement in the first tax return following that. So that would be the tax return, say, from July 1 to December 31 of 2022. 
they can put this statement in that return. So uh, any returns that were filed before this um, uh, revenue procedure was released in mid-January, that is where they can attach the statement to their next tax return and don't have to go back and fix that 22 return that's already been filed. Okay, so transition rule. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the return statement, fairly straightforward. In fact, it's, um, it doesn't necessarily get too granular. So what you need to include are taxpayer identification information, what the tax year of change would be, beginning and ending years, uh, the DCN, the designated automatic change, number is 265, you've done a 3115 automatic change, you're familiar with that. Uh, description of specific R&D expenditures. These will be the items that you're including, whether direct or indirect, fully including or allocating what they are. So it would be things like rent, things like salaries, benefits, et cetera. Uh, what we have been doing is tying that to trial balance accounts and including the methodology we're utilizing in allocating those expenses. Um, typically what you have, you're gonna have are your R&D credit, if they're taking an R&D credit expenses, you're gonna have um, things that are directly allocated outside of that calculation. And then you're gonna have a bucket of allocated expenses, whether they're GNA or otherwise. Um, it, and generally you're gonna be allocating those based on one methodology. There may be some outliers that you need to explain and otherwise. Uh, but generally identifying the different accounts so that it can be tied. You don't need to include the amounts that you're doing there, just the items that you're doing and a description of them. The next line, next item that you need to include is the total overall capitalized amount. Um, and then there's a statement that the above change is basically a description of the changes. And if you look at the rev proc, they basically lay out exactly what needs to go in there word for word. So that can be copied right into the, into the statement. Okay. All right. This next slide is research credit specific. Um, what, what this gets at is, um, historically speaking, when you claim a research credit by operation of a code section called 280C, uh, the taxpayer has to reduce its deductions in that year by the amount of the credit. Um, now going forward, uh, only to the extent the credit exceeds the amount of RME expense that is amortized in the year, does 280C apply? Um, it will be rare that the research credit is larger than the 174 amortization in the year. It's possible in the first year because you're really only getting a 10, but it's, it's only going to happen in like one of two cases. One where you're claiming an alternative simplified credit and the prior three year uh, qualified research expenses are extremely smaller than the amount in the current year so that you get a, a very large amount of the current year expenses that are um, credit eligible. Um, or if you get a short taxable year, you know, just a few months and as you go through the math, somehow the, uh, the amount of R&E expense that's amortizable just over that short period ends up being a, little, a hair under what the, what the research credit is. Um, those are really the only two cases. The good thing is, um, while you will have higher taxable income as a result of identifying 174 expenses that have to be capitalized and amortized, the research credit is, for most taxpayers, going to be the full gross credit with no reduction um, of deductions by the amount of the credit because there's no deductions for the most part, or fewer anyway. Um, so the credit will be the full gross credit for most taxpayers. There'll be no election to make uh, the reduced credit under Section 2AC. All right, state and foreign tax considerations. And I think this is getting close to our last slide. So uh, everybody, I just wanna put you on notice, there's one more polling question after this. But um, you know, for many states, the beginning uh, line item is what is your federal taxable income? And with that in mind, this is gonna have an effect on your state filings to the extent that you're, if you have a higher taxable income, that will flow through the states. Now, certain states, except the tax code as it existed, say, in 2013 or some prior year. So this wouldn't necessarily apply uh, in that particular case. It's going to be state by state, but it will have an effect on your state. It can have an effect on many of your state filings. Additionally, uh, 174 changes are going to modify the taxable income. 
uh, number that provides the starting point for tax calculations such as FIDI beat and, and the foreign tax credit. So it's not just the research credit calculation, it actually will be affecting some other areas of the tax law as well. So we're in discussion with our international tax brethren as well on this. Uh, they're looking to us for understanding 174 uh, because it's gonna flow through to the FIDI guilty and B calcs. So, all right, last slide, last polling question. I'll do it. All right, has your company started to identify its section 174 cost to capitalize? Yes, we would like some assistance. We're happy to give it. Unsure, maybe at a later time or no, we're all set. Again, as we wait for the results here, I just wanna take a minute to thank everybody who put the time into this, both those who did the slides and those who participated and attended today. It's an hour out of your day. I hope you got benefit out of it. It's clearly important. It's affecting taxpayers across the board. Um, and you know, we just wanna be there for anybody that um, needs assistance or additional help thinking about this because while it has been in the law since 2017 and it was intended to come in in 2022, um, many, many, every really tax provider thought this would be, uh, kick, they would kick the can down the road on this one or that it would be retroactively taken out of the code, um, but it didn't and it wasn't and, and it's here. And so it's at least here to stay for 2022. Do we hope something happens in the future? We do and I wouldn't be surprised if it does, if this rule changes at some point with maybe a catch up provision on the un, on the untaken amortization, but we don't know. And, and we'll see. Marty, there is actually a question around that in yeah. the Q&A box. Um, what are you seeing, you know, uh, companies doing to kind of push or Congress to push this out, try to repeal it, maybe retroactively or not? Um, I mean, there's a number of industry groups, lobbyists, working groups across the board. No one wants this. No one's pro this idea. No Republican, no Democrat is pro this idea. It was a pay for when it had when it came into the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, and perhaps it was never intended to actually kick in, but it did. Um, and so um, I, I think the pressure's on Congress. It's really just a matter of find the right timing and the right legislative vehicle to attach it to, um, they're well aware of the fact that this is unpopular uh, by virtue of how many, by virtue of how many people signed up today to listen to me, I know it's unpopular. So I, I, <laughs> I, I think everyone's aware of this and uh, Congress, I would imagine, will address this at some point. Great. Vivian, you want to go on to the last slide? And Maddie, I'll turn it back over to you to uh, sort of close this out with what folks can expect next. All right, thank you guys so much. Uh, you know, Vivian, Corning, Marty, Sarah, we really appreciate all your insights and valuable information that you shared with us today. You covered a lot of detail and really a short amount of time. So if you do have any questions for this group today, here's their contact info on the slide in front of you. We value your feedback, so we will be sharing a short survey at the conclusion. And just a reminder, we recorded this session. We'll be sharing a copy of the recording along with the slides for you uh, in about a week. And uh, with that, if you guys have any other information, feel free to jump in here. But um, thank you again so much for everything today. That's it. Thank you all very much, and we hope to hear from you soon. <laughs>